Excellent. We'd like to welcome each and every one of you once again to the Make Christianity Great Again series. If you're excited to be here, turn to the person next to you and say, I am excited to be here. Turn to that person. All right, all right. If you are going to be here tomorrow, turn to the person who is on the other side of you and say, Be here tomorrow. Be here tomorrow. Be here tomorrow. Be here tomorrow. Awesome, 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 awesome. And then, if you're going to be here the day after tomorrow, turn to the person behind you and say, be here the day after tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, man. We got to keep on coming out because this is the most exciting thing taking place in Columbus right now. Make, a, make Christianity great again. And as you all know, as I said to you each and every single night, this series is not political. Instead, this series is what, everyone? Spiritual. As I say to you each and every single night, there used to be a time where Christians agitated the society. Now Christians only conform to the society. There used to be a time where Christians stood up for something. Now people wonder if Christians stand up for anything. If this is the case, it is time to, to make Christianity great again. But we're not going to make Christianity great again by becoming more conservative. And we're not going to make Christianity great again by becoming more liberal. We're going to make Christianity great again by becoming more biblical. And that's why we're going to be here each and every night from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock p.m. And when you come here, what can you expect? You can expect several things. You can expect for your hearts to be lifted up in passionate worship by our praise team and our singing groups that have ministered to us. You can expect yourself to experience various creative activities. Yesterday we got a chance to witness a creative activity by our man called Enoch, and today we had another one with Harrison. And Kofi has been the one leading out these creative activities. Let's give him a round of applause for doing such a great job. Day in and day out, day in and day out. He's bringing out these great activities, and I'm asking myself, where is he even getting these things from? In addition to that as well, the Make Christianity Great Again series is a time of food and refreshments. And I see some good food is being prepared outside. In addition to that as well, the Make Christianity Great Again series is a time of spiritual insights. And like what I said to you yesterday, if there's something from the message that speaks to your heart, what we want you to do is that we want you to use this hashtag right here. Great Again 18. You go on any social media platform and you can be able to share that insight that you have gained. The Make Christianity Great Again series is a time of clarity. If there's something you've been confused about, this is the place for you. And last, but certainly not least, the Make Christianity Great Again series is a time of what, everyone? Let me hear everyone say it loudly. It's a time of? No, that was someone. I need everyone. The Make Christianity Great Again series is a time of what, everyone? It's a time of decisions. Every day in life we make decisions, big ones, small ones, and medium-sized decisions. But today I'm here to submit to you that the most important decision is to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And just like our friend on the picture, go down in the waters and to be baptized. Tonight I have a powerful message coming from above. Last night's message was called Make the... Oh man, come on y'all, make the... Make the Bible great again. But tonight's message is entitled, 
make Christianity mature again. Make Christianity, what everyone? Mature again. Make Christianity mature again. Are you guys ready for this message today? Oh man, you guys are not ready. Are you all ready for this message today? Yeah. All right. I'm going to begin my sermon this way. The way I'm going to begin my sermon is a bit interactive. I'm going to place some scenarios on the screen. After I place the scenario on the screen, I'm going to ask you a question. The question is this. I'm going to ask you whether the scenario on the screen describes a person who is mature or a person who is immature. After that, I'll say a prayer and we'll launch into our message. Let's begin with the first scenario. The first scenario is this. A guy is 31 years old, he's working, and he's making not just a decent living, but he's making a good living. But this person is still living in his parents' house. Is this person mature or immature? What do you say? Mature. Uh, mature? You guys sure? The man is making a good living. Mature? The guy's making a really good living. You don't need his parents. He's saving money. You guys are true Ganyans. All right. I see it. True Ganyans. Saving money. So let me see the hands of those who say mature. Let me see the hands of those who say mature. Hey, now you guys are debating. Let me see the hands of those who say mature. Okay, put them down. Let me see the hands of those who say immature. Uh-huh. All right. All right. Come on. Somebody, why do you say immature? Why do you say immature? Yes. Go ahead, Chrissy. Uh-huh, Chrissy said he's making money, but he should be making money to find his own place. Chrissy, I see what you're saying. Now, what do you say? Uh-huh. <laughs> you don't know? It's all right. Some, a lot of people here don't know either, so that's fine. All right. So some of you say mature. Some of you say immature. Some of you are in the valley of decision. Second scenario. Let's put it on the screen. Now, this one's specifically for the parents. I want to see what the parents are going to say. Now, the next one that's coming up. That's what's specifically for the parents. I want to see what the parents are going to say. Boom! Let's throw it up. Your daughter is 20 years old. She comes home from college and she says, Mom, I'm ready to get married right now. Would you consider your daughter to be mature or immature? Let me hear. Oh, immature. <laughs> immature, you sure? Someone says mature? Oh, someone says it depends. They're trying to get tricky with me. All right. You got to choose. Let me see the hands of those who say mature. Oh, okay. Yes, uncle. Uncle, I want to hear you. Why do you say mature? Why do you say mature? Marriage is not a just like a pleasure for work. Uh-huh. Someone says he's ready to marry. Uh-huh. He knows why. He, he knows why. She knows why. I'll come up with you. Come there. He knows why. She knows why. All right. Who says immature? Who says immature? Who says immature? All right. All right. Okay. She says immature. Why do you say immature? Yes. Yes. Okay. 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 She's only 20 years old. She doesn't know the husband fully. She needs some more time. All right. Let's put the hands down. Let's put the hands down. I got another scenario for you. I got another scenario. Are you guys ready? Oh, this one is touchy. This one is touchy. This one will touch a little feelings, though. Don't get mad at me, though. I'm just exploring the concept. This one's a little touchy. You got a girl. She's 27 years old. So technically speaking, according to the demographics by sociologists, she is a young adult. But the truth of the matter is she still can't step out of the house without wearing makeup. Whether it's to the grocery store, to the gym, anywhere she goes. Is this person mature or is this person immature? Ah! Uh-oh! Uh-oh! Now, 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 I saw your hand was raised. What you doing? So let's hear. Mm-hmm. 
So here's the question. That's why we said she's 27. So at least by 27, you should have taken some time to fix your insecurity. No. It's deep. Doesn't matter how old you are. So what would you rank this person, mature or immature? Okay, mature. All right. What do you say? You say immature, Ati? Why do you say immature? Okay. Come on, Auntie, come on, Auntie, you're working at gospel. Come on, Auntie, you're working at gospel. Auntie, you're working at gospel. All right, all right, all right. All right, all right, all right, all right. All right. Okay, my next one, my next one's gonna be a little hot too. My next one is specifically for those who attend the North American Ghanaian Seventh-day Adventist Youth Camp. This is very specific. So those who've never attended it before, it's okay. You're gonna be a spectator at this moment and you're gonna be entertained by the way people respond to this one. Now all the guys who are here, this one concerns you guys. So I want you guys to really engage on this one. The question, sorry, the scenario is this. <clears throat> the scenario is this. A guy sees you at youth camp, I'm gonna add that part. But the guy waits until the last day of youth camp to approach you and ask for your phone number. <laughs> ah, come on, la, 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 la. Let's work on that one. Come on, y'all. The guy is shy. The guy is shy. All right. Order in the court, order in the court. I want my friend right here to speak up. Stand up, stand strong. Mature or immature, talk to me. Hey, 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 hey. What do you mean? All right, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Come on, y'all, let's hear it, let's hear it. Immature, he's waiting until the last day. Uh-huh. He's not gonna see her for another 365 days. Oh. <laughs> All right, so. He should have been working in advance because he may not be able to see him for the whole year. Auntie Joe, Auntie Joe, I want to hear Auntie Joe. Oh, be the devil right now. <clears throat> ah, easy, Auntie Joe. Hmm. Ah, uh huh. That's right. <laughs> I'm loving it, I'm loving it, I'm loving it, I'm loving it, I'm loving it. Good, we're having some fun, we're having some fun. I got one more for you. I got one more for you. Now this one is a little bit more somber, so I can place you in a reflective mood. The scenario is this. An elder in the church has a lot of Bible knowledge and can even explain the Bible very well. Now, I'm not talking about this church because the scenario says, however, he or she, and you know, there's not really female elders in this church, so the Bible says, <laughs> the Bible says he or she has a bad temper. You consider this elder to be mature or immature? Some say immature. Let me see the hand of those who say immature. Let me see, the guy has a lot of Bible knowledge though. Let me see the hand of say mature. Oh, he's struggling. 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 All right, everyone, hands down. I got to move on with my sermon because I have to finish by nine. Can I get everyone's attention, please? The reason why I gave you all these different scenarios is because I gave you these scenarios so that you could realize that many times in life, our definition of what maturity is, is often relative, subjective, and imprecise. I'll say that again. The reason why I gave these different scenarios is so that we could come to the awareness that many times in life, our definition of what maturity is, is often relative, subjective, and imprecise. But the beautiful thing about the Bible 
is that when it comes to spiritual maturity, the Bible does not leave us in the dark as to what it means to be spiritually mature. In fact, the Bible gives us a window. We find this window in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Everyone observe. This is what the Bible says. I'm going to read the whole chapter. Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but I have not what, everyone? Oh, no, come on, y'all. But I have not what, everyone? I am a noisy gang or a clanging symbol. Verse 2. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I have not I am nothing. I'm on verse 3. If I give away all I have, and I, if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not, I gain nothing. Paul continues. He says in verse 4, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears how many things? Oh, come on, church, you all are not with me today. I'm not liking that. I'm giving you energy. Give me some energy back. Come on, church. Love bears how many things? Oh. It believes how many things? Oh. It hopes how many things? Oh. It endures how many things? Oh. Paul says love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. I'm on verse 9. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. And this is a point I want to hit. Paul says when I was a child, he spoke like a child. He thought like a child, reasoned like a child. But he says when I became a man, I did something specific. I gave away childish ways. Watch what he says in verse 12. He's bringing the argument home. He says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall be fully known, even if I, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is which one, everyone? Love. Pay attention here. I'm about to bring something home. Hear me. This one is going to be good. You see, within 1 Corinthians chapter 13, hear me now, don't miss this. If you miss this, you miss the whole sermon. Come on, listen carefully now. I'm going somewhere. Within 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul uses a metaphor of a child. Are you all with me? He uses the metaphor of a child. He says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. Then he switched his metaphor. He transitioned from childhood to adulthood. He said, when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Stick with me. I'm making a point. Paul uses the metaphor of a child to describe immaturity. Are you guys hearing that? Then Paul uses the metaphor of adulthood to describe maturity. And in describing immaturity and maturity within the context of love, Paul defines for us what maturity really is. And this is Paul's definition of spiritual maturity. Paul's definition is this. Paul's definition is the person who is the most loving is the person who is the most mature. Oh, shoot, y'all. Y'all not hearing me. Y'all not hearing me. Kofi, they're going to make me preach up in here. You guys are not hearing me. You see, in church, we're under the impression that the person who has the most Bible knowledge is the one who is most mature. Or we're under the impression that the person who is the most opinionated is the one who is most mature. Or we're under the impression that the person who is the most independent is the one who is most mature. Or we're under the impression that the person who dresses the most modestly is the one who is most mature. Or we even think that the person who is the most gifted with music or the most gifted with speaking is the one who is most mature. But here's what I'm here to share with you tonight. I am here to share with you tonight that the most mature person is not any of these individuals, but instead the person who is the most loving is the person who is the most mature. Jesus said it himself. He said, they will know we are Christians by our love. If we're going to make Christianity great again, we must realize that it starts by being mature. And maturity is defined by love. 
Therefore, within 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul gives nine clarifications. Nine clarifications of what a loving person looks like. Quickly, let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that as we go through these nine clarifications of what a loving person looks like, speak to our hearts, speak to our souls, speak to our minds. Help us to see Jesus. Help us to love like Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm moving through these very quickly, so you have to stick with me. The first clarification. The first clarification that Paul gives is, we find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 and 3. The first clarification that Paul gives is that a mature person recognizes that love is their ultimate priority. That's the first thing. I'll say it again. A mature person realizes that love is their highest priority priority. A mature person realizes that love is a greater priority than spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 1. A mature person realizes that love is a greater priority than prophecy. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 2. A mature person realizes that love is a greater priority than knowledge. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 2. A mature person recognizes that love is a greater priority than even faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 2. And a mature person recognizes that love is a greater priority than martyrdom. Stick with me now, church. Don't miss it. The reason why a mature person sees love as a priority is because the mature person has realized that the greatest way to influence people is through love. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Let me give you an illustration. This is when I was in East Africa, Kenya. Certain lady, the lady that you see on the screen came to me and she said these words to me that I will never forget. She said, I want to meet the pastor. Cause I went to Kenya in 2012 and I went back again in 2013. She said, I want to meet the pastor who baptized me. <sighs> wow, okay. So they called me. And she looked at me and she looked at me and when she looked at me, she said these words. She said, Pastor, I will never leave the Adventist church. So I'm sitting here saying, why? So in my mind, I'm assuming that she says she's never going to leave the Adventist church because she was just razzled and dazzled by my amazing homiletics. All right, All right. And she was blown away by my exegesis and torn apart by my hermeneutics. Right. Let me tell you what that lady said. That lady didn't say one thing about my preaching. Okay. <laughs> that lady looked at me, and this is the word she said. I'll never forget the word she said. She said, all my years that I've been alive, no pastor has ever come to my house to visit me. You're the first person that did. Amen. Secondly, all my life, no church has ever come and given clothes to me. You're the first church that did. And because you showed me love, I will never leave this Seventh-day Adventist church. Amen. That day, it taught me a lesson. And the lesson it taught me that was this, that my knowledge is not the greatest way to influence people. No, it is not. That my influence, that my charisma is not the greatest way to influence people. No, it is not. That my talents are not the greatest way to influence people. No, it is not. But the reason why the mature person has realized that love should be a priority is that love is the greatest way to influence people in this world. We don't need more people who are educated. First and foremost, we need more people who are loving. A mature person is a loving person. But there's a second clarification that Paul gives as to what a mature person looks like. And the second clarification is this. Paul lets us know that a mature person is a patient person. A mature person is a what type of person, everyone? Patient. Everyone look at it. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, that love is what, everyone? Patient. Okay, now stick with me carefully. I'm going to show you something from the Bible. You see, in the Bible, in the original language, there are two words for patience. How many words, everyone? Two. You see, the first word for patience is what we call hupomone. Now, here, stick with me carefully. The word hupomone is the ability to show patience, watch this now, in the face of trying circumstances. 
But there's a second word for patience, and this second word for patience is used in our passage. The second word for patience is a word called macrothumia, and the word macrothumia demonstrates, watch this now, the ability to show patience, ah, stick with me, this one is good, the ability to show patience in the face of trying people. Come on, let me see the hands of those who know some trying people. Some people who will try everything in you. They'll try your brain, they'll try your food, they'll try and give you nothing in return. But here, 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 watch me now. The mature person is not the person who insults trying people. The mature person is the person who can demonstrate patience in the face of trying people. A mature person is a patient person. But the scripture gives us a third clarification of what a mature person looks like. And the third clarification is this. A mature person is a kind person. How do we know that? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, that love is what everyone? Kind. But not only that, the Bible also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, that love is not what everyone? Rule. Now stick with me carefully. I'm going to show you something. You see, the reason why I put patience and kindness together is because these two are couplets. They work with one another. You see, patience and kindness teach us how to deal with trying people. Watch the screen carefully. I'm showing you a comparison. You see, patience is the passive way to deal with trying people. When you demonstrate patience, the biggest thing that you're exercising is what, everyone? Restraint. And so I remember in New York, when we wanted to fight somebody, then, you know, you're about to fight the person that you say someone, hold me back, hold me back, hold me back, I'm about to fight, hold me back, hold me back. You know, you know, they wasn't about to do nothing anyway, but they said, hold me back, hold me back. Okay, that's what patience is doing. Patience is Jesus inside of you saying, hold me back, hold me back. Is everyone with me? Now that's patience. Let me show you what kindness does. You see, while patience is the passive way to deal with trying people, kindness is the active way to deal with trying people. You see, you shouldn't only deal with trying people in a passive way, you need to also deal with trying people in a what everyone, in an active way. And in patience, you show restraint, but with kindness, you show service. Is everyone following me? This is what mature people do. Are you mature? Let me find out. There's a fourth clarification. I told you I'm moving quick. There's a fourth clarification that Paul gives as to what a mature person looks like. The fourth clarification is this. Paul lets us know that a mature person is not only a kind person, but Paul lets us know that a mature person is also a content person. A mature person displays contentment. How do I know? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, that love does not what everyone? Envy. Love does not envy. Let me give you a little bit of an illustration. There was a story that comes from Greek mythology. The story goes as follows. Two eagles were flying. And as these two eagles, in the mentioning of the word eagles, I feel like Pippin. Now two eagles were flying. <laughs> now two eagles were flying. And as these two eagles were flying, one eagle was flying higher than the other eagle. And so the eagle that was flying a little bit lower began to, hear it now, began to envy the eagle that was flying a little bit, what everyone? Higher. All right. And so because the eagle was flying lower, and the other eagle was flying higher, and the lower flying eagle began to feel some envy, this is what the lower flying eagle started to do. The lower flying eagle started to pluck out some of his feathers, transform them into arrows, and pew, shoot them at the higher flying eagle. So pluck, shoot, pluck, shoot, pluck, shoot. But here's the beauty of people who are high flyers. That high flying eagle just mm, dodge them bullets, dodge them bullets, dodge them bullets, dodge them bullets, dodge them bullets. And all of a sudden, the lower flying eagle started to realize that because it was plucking out too many of its feathers, it lost weight in its wings and the lower eagle 
sank all the way to the ground. Stick with me, I'm making a point about envy. This is the biggest lesson that I have learned about envy. Envy destroys the person who is envying more than the person who is being envied. Oh, y'all, y'all not hearing me today. Envy destroys the person who is envying more than the person who is being envied. And so while you're busy destroying yourself by envying others, the person who you are envying is just flying high like an eagle. A mature person has learned to be a content person within this life. But then there's another clarification that Paul gives. Paul gives us a fifth clarification. Paul lets us know that a mature person is not only a content person, but a mature person is also a humble person. How do I know that? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4 that love does not do what, everyone? But not only that, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 4, the Bible says love is not what, everyone? Okay, now I'm about to teach you guys something you probably never knew. Now, when we talk about people who are prideful, we usually assume, watch me now, we usually assume that people who are rich, like Bill Gates, or people who are beautiful, like Beyonce, or people who are talented, like Will Smith, or people who are powerful, like my president, Obama, people feel like because you are rich, because you are beautiful, or because you are talented, and because you are powerful, then you are prideful. But that's not necessarily the truth. Do you know that you don't have to be rich, beautiful, talented, or powerful to be prideful? People who are poor, ugly, untalented, and not powerful can be prideful as well. Did you know that? Do you know what we call it? We call it self-pity. Notice the comparison between boasting and self-pity. You see, boasting, this is what we're usually accustomed to, boasting is the response of pride to success. But watch it now, watch it now, this one is good. You see, this is why you gotta come to the Make Christianity Great Again. Watch it. You see, self-pity is the response of pride to suffering. Notice this one. Boasting says, I deserve admiration because I have achieved so much. Self-pity says, I deserve admiration because I have suffered so much. Hmm. Notice this one. Boasting is the voice of the pride in the heart of the strong. Self-pity is the voice of pride in the heart of the who, everyone? The weak. Notice this one. You see, Everyone knows what boasting is because boasting sounds self-sufficient. But you see, self-pity is camouflage because it sounds self-sacrificing. Watch this one. You see, at the end of the day, at the heart of it all, a person boasts when they have a what type of ego? Elevated ego. But you see, self-pity, a person has self-pity when they have a wounded ego. At the end of the day, these are one and the same because boasting says, look at myself, but self-pity also says, look at who everyone, self. A mature person avoids these two. And so, bottom line is this. A person is not prideful because they are smart, rich, talented, or privileged, but you are prideful when you start to play the game of comparison and competition. I am smarter than, I am richer than, I am more talented than, I am more privileged than, and as soon as you start to see as yourself as superior and someone else as inferior, that's when you have fallen captive to the poison of pride. 
And ultimately, the poison of pride will destroy your relationships in life. It will kill trust that people have in you. It will prevent people from having an honest conversation with you. It will remove integrity from your life. But if you have humility, it will enhance your relationships. It will build trust. It will encourage honest dialogue, and it will create integrity. A mature person runs away from pride and embraces maturity. If you agree with that, let me hear you say amen. Amen. Let me move on. I have a sixth clarification. The sixth clarification is that a mature person is a what type of person, everyone? Is a? No, y'all are not with me. A mature person is a what type of person? Is a? Selfless person. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, love is not what, everyone? Self-seeking. You see, in Jesus' time, people were highly self-seeking. All they wanted was honor and to avoid shame. And so this command was revolutionary. Don't just seek out for your own interest. Also seek out for the interest of others. I got a seventh clarification. I told you, I only have nine today, and I'm already on number seven, and it's only 8.45, and so I'm making good time. This is the biggest one I want to harp on. A mature person is a forgiving person. Look at what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5. It says, love keeps no records of wrongs. Love keeps no records of wrongs. Now, let me see the hands of those who have trouble forgiving sometimes. Let me see the hand. Okay, you guys want to, okay, it's church. Okay, all right, now, let me, now let me tell you guys. Let me tell you guys me. Now, I'm a person who I thought that I was pretty good at forgiving others. I thought, are y'all with me? Now, some of y'all are not with me. Are y'all tweeting or are y'all doing something else? Come on, y'all. Y'all with me? Now, I was the type of person who thought that I was good at forgiving others. Not until a situation took place. So now, I had a friend. I got to be careful how I tell this story because nowadays I'm live. So I had a friend whom back in school, I won't say high school or middle school, we were, I'm talking about we were best friends. I'm talking about we were so much of best friends to the point where, to the point where, and don't judge me y'all, but to the point where even one time she had to go to an abortion clinic and I went there to keep her some company. We were that great of friends. Now that that wasn't my baby y'all, come on. That wasn't my baby, that wasn't my baby y'all. Let's get that clear. That was not my baby. Hallelujah, 25 and and, and still pure, praise God. Come on, y'all, give give, give, give a hand of applause to Jesus Christ, y'all. Now stick with me, stick with me, stick with me. (laughs) That was not my baby, Lord knows. So I'm I'm telling y'all we were good friends. Y'all got to see the friendship now. You don't just go to an abortion clinic with anybody. Now, one summer I came back home from school and I said, well, this is my good friend. Let me reconnect with my good friend. So I pick up the phone and I call. Ah, no pickup. Called one time, two times. I called that person that summer 14 times. Never picked up my phone call. I went back to school, came back the next summer. Don't get me wrong, I was burned. I was hurt. But I said, you know what? I'm a Christian. Matter of fact, I'm a preacher. Let me try and practice what I preach. Guess what? Picked up my phone again. Gave her a call. One time. Two times. <sighs> Probably called me a fool. I called her again that summer 10 times. I counted it. T- just in case we got into an argument, I could bring those numbers out. I counted it 10 times. Sent messages and even sent a Facebook message still no response and I said I'm done I'm finished with this person comes the next year I told myself I'm done with this person I'm talking about whatever I'm not I'm done came the next year unfortunately a family member in this person's life died so I say you know what let me be another Christian sent the person a message on Facebook sorry for your loss Finally, for the first time, the person responded back to me. So I said, wow, this is my chance. I said, hey, do you want to meet up this summer? Guess what? No response. I said, I'm finished with you. And so I remember this year came about, and the person, I don't know why, sent me a message on my birthday saying, happy birthday. I hope everything is well with you. I hope you're doing good. So at this time, y'all, you know I feel a little salty. And I'm feeling real petty right now. So guess what I did? Now, you guys who are on social media, you know how we do this. 
I went on Facebook, <laughs> clicked on that message, made sure that she saw that I seen that message, <laughs> and I left that girl on scene. I said, I'm gonna leave you right here. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm leaving you right there on scene. Every day I woke up in the morning, I said, any new, oh, who, uh, mm, scene, huh, scene, scene. <sighs> Until one day I was sitting there and the Holy Spirit asked me a question. He said, Koja, I know you're hurt, but are you really being mature? I said, Lord, don't bring this stuff to me right now. <laughs> Nah, nah, the word came back again. I said, Kojo, because at the end of the day, a mature person is not the preaching person. The mature person is the forgiving person. And so, y'all, I got, I got the strength about three days ago, don't judge me, to finally respond back to that message. But hear me now. Hear me now. This still doesn't mean I have forgiven her. But I need to. Not because, stick with me now, not because of what she's done for me. But the scripture says we need to forgive for Christ's sake. Oh, you see, y'all don't believe in that word. Y'all don't believe in that word. You see, the scripture says that while we were enemies towards God, God demonstrated forgiveness towards us. And so we forgive not because that other person has shown love to us, but we forgive because we had so many sins, but Christ has forgiven us. We forgive not for that person's sake. We forgive first and foremost for Christ's sake. One person who forgave by Christ, for Christ's sake was a guy called Richard Wormbrand. Do you know who he is? He was an underground pastor in communist Romania. He wrote a book called Tortured for Christ. And I'll never forget the contents that I read in this book. Let me tell you a little bit of what took place there. Because Romania was such a communist country, they did not permit Christianity at all to thrive over there. And so when they caught Richard preaching the gospel, they put him in jail. But jail in Romania, communist Romania, is not jail in 21st century America. Jail in communist America means torture and they tortured that man. He said sometimes what they would do is that they would hang him upside down and literally he could count 18 holes that they burned into his body. At one time, they put him in a box, hear me now. They put him in a box with nails pointing on the inside and they forced him to stand for two weeks. Guys, I get tired standing up for like one hour. They forced him to stand for two weeks, but here was the trick. The trick was that in the jail, it was cold. So as you're standing in the box, what is your legs doing? It's shaking. As it's shaking, what is it hitting? Those nails that are on the inside. He writes in his book that sometimes what they would do is that they would put him in a fridge and they would freeze him until the point of almost death. And then they would take him out of the fridge thaw him out, put him back in the fridge to start the process all over again. He said that these physical afflictions to the body were terrible, but even the worst was the psychological damage that they tried to do to him. They tried to brainwash him and tell him that Christianity was bad and that communism was good. And so what they would do is that they would put him inside solitary confinement. And while he was there, there was a 24-hour rotation where people would come inside and all they would say is this, Communism is good. Communism is good. Christianity is evil. Christianity is evil. Communism is good. Communism is good. Christianity is evil. Christianity is evil. He literally heard those words for 24 hours straight almost every day. People began to ask him the question after his release. How did you survive such an ordeal? That was the question. And that was the only part that I was interested in after reading such a atrocious and horrendous accounts. And this is what he said. He said, the only way I was able to survive that ordeal is that while I was in that prison cell, I realized that survival is not about the body, survival is about the spirit. 
And so I realized that if I let my spirit degenerate into bitterness, they would kill me. And so I maintained, oh, hear him now. He said, I maintain an attitude of forgiveness. God, no, no, those were his words. Those are not mine. I'm not twisting the story to make it sound good. You can read it yourself. It's in a book called Tortured for Christ. He said, I maintain a spirit of forgiveness. And because I did, I was able to survive. The only way you can survive in this life is by maintaining an attitude of forgiveness. A mature person is not only a forgiving person, but a mature person is able to display what everyone? Stamina. Look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 7, love bears all things. But not only does it bear all things, love believes all things. Not only that, love hopes all things. And, unbelie- and love endures all things. A mature person doesn't quit when the going gets tough. But a mature person gets stronger when the tough gets going. A mature person displays stamina. But last and finally not least, Paul lets us know that a mature person is not a perfect person. Look at what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12. It says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, by then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Come on, y'all, listen to me now. I'm closing on this. Are y'all with me? Do I have everyone's attention now? Come on, y'all. Is everyone here? Everyone here with me? Y'all here? If Kofi can help me on the piano. Zeke, if you guys can help me on the piano. Come on, y'all. Hear me now. A mature person is not a perfect person. A mature person doesn't mean they've gotten all the eggs correct. But if a mature person is not a perfect person, then what is a mature person? Watch the quotation. Mature people are not perfect people. Instead, mature people are imperfect people who are willing to trust in a perfect Savior. Say amen to that, everyone. Mature people are not perfect people. No, they're not. Mature people are imperfect people who are willing to trust in a perfect Savior. And so this evening, I want to ask you a question. Are you mature? Are you mature? Now guys, honestly, when I look at this sermon, when I look at this characteristics, I sit back and I say, "Ah, patience? Nah, I don't have that. Kindness? Ah, I kind of sometimes have that. Forgiveness? Well, y'all know my story. Stamina? Maybe. But when I look at the whole list, I kind of... I come to the painful conclusion that nah, I'm not as mature as I think. I'm not as mature as I want to be. And because I'm not mature, my heart cries, who can help me? Who can save me? I remember I was in New York City. And while I was in New York City, that looks like New York City. I haven't even seen a place in Columbus that looked like that. I remember I was in New York City, I was out there playing some basketball. Give it, a, give it a second, Joseph. I'll give you your cue. So I remember I was out playing basketball. Come on, y'all, let me see the hands of those who play basketball up in here. Y'all play ball? Now you all know one part of playing basketball is what we call trash talking. Who has ever trash talked before? Come on, be honest. Shame the, okay, good. So I remember when I was on the court and I was playing, some other kid was there. So guess what I decided to do? Decided to do some trash talking. Oh man, you can't shoot. Man, my mother dribbled better than you and she don't even know how to hold a basketball. Mom, I'm sorry, but you know, you have to use the jokes out there. Yeah, yeah. I'm finishing this dude. This dude is getting mad at me. He's getting mad at me. But you know, it's all part of the sport, right? That's where I'm headed to. The next day comes, and I'm on the court practicing by myself. Shoot, shoot. You guys can tell my form is kind of bad right now, but don't worry about it. So I remember I finished practicing, took the ball in my hand, and I started walking home. And as soon as I was walking home, guess who I see? K 
kid I was trash talking to yesterday. But this time, I'm by myself. Kid is not by himself. He looks at me and says, yeah, that's that beep that was trash talking to me yesterday. I said, oh crap, I'm finished. He looked at his face, he said, yeah, he was the one trash talking. Get him, get him. So I said to myself, damn, how am I about to do this? I said, well, maybe what I can do is that I can rush on one of the guys, knock him out in the face, push him to the ground, and make a run for it. So I tried to execute my plan. I made a run for the guy, but as soon as I made a run for the guy, some of his other guys had sneaked from the back. Boom, one of the guys caught me by my arms, another one caught me by my neck, and they trapped me in an arm lock and a headlock. At that point, I knew I was finished. I said, that's it for me. Now that kid didn't come by himself. He had a metal bat in his hand. <laughs> you see, y'all are blessed to live in Columbus. <laughs> and I said, nah, he not gonna hit me with that metal bat. Uh, sure enough, that man picked up that metal bat. And I said, nah, he's not gonna swing it. Boom, straight to my knees. Lifted up again, came for another one. Boom, straight again to my knees. Stick me now, I'm making a point here. As those blows were going straight to my legs and I was put in a harm lock and a headlock. Though I was experiencing a painful situation, because I was in the arm lock and headlock, I knew that effectively and efficiently I had no strength to get myself out of that situation. Stick with me. This is the way sin operates. Sin has put you and I in an arm lock and a headlock. And due to the crippling effect of sin, we have no strength to make ourselves mature. We have no strength to make ourselves loving. We have no strength to make ourselves Christ-like. We are totally ineffective. We are totally powerless and we are totally inefficient. And sin is taking its metal bat and every day swinging its blows. And so as my legs were getting tore up, I said, God, you got to get me out of this one. As I looked into the horizon, a friend of mine was walking down the block. Gideon, you know this guy. His name is called Naaman Kwa. His name is Seth. Seth was a taller guy, bigger guy. And Seth was coming to play some ball with me. And so as Seth was approaching, I looked and I said, Yo, Seth! Yo, these guys are trying to beat me up. Come and help me out. Seth was a bigger guy. So Seth saw that his friend was in trouble and boom! started running towards me, started running towards me. Those kids knew that, nah, big guys in town, we can't deal with this dude, and pff, they all started running away from me. And when that took place, I remember I reflected back on that situation, and I said to myself, that's how it works in our lives. Though sin has made us powerless, we can call on someone who is bigger than us. We can call on someone who is stronger than us. We can call on someone who is more powerful than us to rescue us from the situation. Some call that person Jehovah Jireh. Some call that person the first and the last. Some call that person the Rose of Sharon. I call that person Jesus Christ. And when you get on your knees and you call on Jesus, Jesus, your more powerful friend, Jesus, your more stronger friend, Jesus, your more bigger friend, will come and he will give you the strength that you desperately need. And if you want to be mature, you must call on Jesus. And Jesus will come and live in your heart and give you the strength to be a mature Christian. What do we say to that, everyone? Amen. But hear me now, I was able to call on Seth because I had a relationship with him. 
you will be able to call on Jesus when you have a relationship with him as well. Joseph, help us with the song. And as Joseph sings the song, I'm going to make a simple appeal. Nobody's coming up to the front today. The time is 9.03, so I'm past my time. I'm going to make a simple appeal. My simple appeal is this. Who wants to be mature? Let me see. Who, wa who wants to be mature? As we've defined it today, keep your hands raised. But you realize that you are not mature. Raise your other hand. You realize that you're not mature. Raise your other hand. Now, you know, if you're in war, when you put up your hands like this, this is the symbol of surrender. So my next question is, who wants to surrender heart, mind, and life to Jesus? So that Jesus can give you that strength that you so desperately need. Your bigger friend, your stronger friend, your more powerful friend to make you mature. Do you want that in your life? If you do, if you want to make that surrender, then I invite you to stand right where you are. If you want to make that surrender, I invite you to stand where you are. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. While on others. And bow your heads. Close your eyes. Let's pray. Lord Jesus. We realize that you have a high standard of maturity, but we're not able to reach that standard. In fact, we have no strength. We are effectively powerless. And sin is swinging its blows on us every single day, and we're losing. But Father, praise be to God that there is a friend who is more powerful than us, there is a friend who is stronger than us. There is a friend who is bigger than us. Who sits at the right hand of the throne of the Father. Who sits and ministers in the most holy place of the sanctuary. Who is ready to give us the strength that we so lack but we so desperately need. And we know that this friend is none other than Jesus Christ. And so we pray that through the power of your spirit, you would reside in each and every one of us so that we can become mature in Jesus, thus making Christianity great again. This is our prayer. This is our plea. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. to